Welcome to the Grad School Femme Touring Podcast, the place for first-gen students of color to prepare for grad school. This is Dr. Yvette Martinez Bu, and I will be serving as your Femme Tour, providing you with tips and tricks and everything else you need to know to get into and successfully navigate grad school. For over 10 years, I've been helping first-gen students of color get into top grad programs in their field, and I'm really excited to support you on your academic journey too. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. This is your host, Doctora Yvette, and today we're going to cover a really important topic, the topic of navigating bipolar disorder in higher education. Our special guest is Dr. Lauren Yang, she, her, who is a clinical psychologist in the Bay Area, California. Currently, she is completing her postdoctoral residency at Kaiser Permanente. Her professional interests include bipolar and other mood disorders, young adult concerns, AANHPI mental health, and BIPOC advocacy. With her lived experience of bipolar 2 disorder, Lauren serves as vice chair of the Young Adult Council for the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. She has contributed to articles, podcast episodes, and panels for DBSA, International Bipolar Foundation, and BP Hope Magazine. She's also a leadership fellow and newsletter co-editor-in-chief in in the Asian American Psychological Association. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Lauren. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, I'm equally as excited to have you here. I would love, love for you to get us started by sharing a little bit more about who you are and what you do and whatever you're comfortable sharing about your background and your backstory too. Yeah, definitely. So I was born and raised in Southern California. Um, I am a second generation multi-ethnic Asian American. So Korean and Filipina are my heritages. I am as of recently a happily married cis woman to my husband. And yes, as mentioned, I have lived with bipolar 2 disorder for the past 10 years now. And I am an early career clinical psychologist working towards her licensure. Uh, So just in brief, you know, what I do is I provide therapy at the outpatient level for adults ranging from as young as 18 years old to as old as 80 plus years old. So really across the lifespan and it's just, yeah, really such enriching work and I'm, I love what I do. Um, I could go on about that, but so uh, a little bit more about my background and backstory, you know, how I got to this point, it's still wild to me that I can say it's been 10 years since my first hypomanic episode and my diagnosis of bipolar 2 disorder. So to run it back all, you know, all the way to that beginning of that journey, you know, mental health was not a concept to me. I didn't have the language, you know, to describe it. Um, And so while, you know, it was a different time for all of us back then around mental health, it's definitely talked about more now. A lot of it is more uh, accepted, but, you know, me and my Asian family did not talk openly about our feelings. And I was even shamed for having pretty big feelings back then. So who knows if that was like early, early signs Uh, But I was a pretty emotionally sensitive kid back then. And I, yeah, was not made to feel good to express those feelings. But um, in any case, you know, it wasn't on my radar. So let alone as a career path, right? So what initially sparked this journey for me was my own mental health experiences, of course, with that first hypomanic episode. Um, Can you describe what that means? I'm so sorry. I just, when you say hypomanic episode for folks who are less familiar with that. Yes, of course. Yeah, no, I was definitely going to go into the symptoms part of it too. And that's a great question. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, so there's hypomania and mania. And so for me, having bipolar 2 disorder, hypomania, in the simplest terms is a less severe form of mania. So for me, at least what that looks like is I wasn't sleeping. I was going off of uh, two to three hours of sleep multiple days in a row and still feeling very energized, actually very productive, prolific. Um, as grandiosity goes, I was, I thought I was going to make this self-help blog uh, that was going to change the world. <laughs> and um, in one night, I came up with like over 60 ideas, I think, for topics for this blog. Um, 
And so, yeah, just running off little amount of sleep, uh, felt like all cylinders were firing. Like I just felt like a lot of things clicked. I was very creative. I felt more engaging, more interesting as a person. Um, but there also comes the irritability part in the, um, hypomania for me. So I was going off on people in public too, for like just minor transgressions, like, uh, cutting me in line at the grocery store. Um, and people close to me, like they really got hurt by, uh, by my words, like my boyfriend at the time, uh, mm. was very much on the receiving end of a lot of that. And unfortunately, you know, we had some, he's, he was my high school boyfriend and we stayed together throughout college in a little bit after, but you know, so there's cracks forming in that relationship, but unfortunately with the nail in the coffin for that was my symptoms, unfortunately, exacerbating that uh, relationship stress. And so, yeah, just to give a picture of what that looked like. And so at that point, you had an understanding that this was different from how you normally behave because of the, like the sleep or the, like you said, you felt prolific or I'm wondering how you arrived at this stage where you realized what it was. Yeah. So at the time I had little insight into that part, like the quote unquote positives or what feels like the benefits of hypomania. I thought literally I was becoming this new and better version of myself. So being towards the end of my fourth year as an undergrad at college, 22 years old, I thought, you know, I was coming out of my shell. Like I've had always been like a pretty reserved and quiet person back then, didn't really speak my mind or just was outspoken in general. So this felt very electrifying to me. It actually felt very gratifying and exciting to me. So there wasn't that insight just yet, but then what really called to my attention of like, I need to get help for this was really the irritability and how I was affecting people around me. Like, you know, anger is one thing, but I was raging at people. Mm. And that is definitely not me. Like I don't cut people with my words just at the flip of a hat, you know? So, um, that's what spurred it. And so, you know, being still an undergrad at college, I was able to access my, um, university counseling center, fortunately able to use those services at the time. Uh, so, you know, in talking, uh, to professionals more there, you know, that's when I first started seeing um, my first therapist, this wonderfully warm man who was, you know, a psychologist back then. I didn't have quite a concept of what, you know, all the different titles in mental health meant uh, just yet, but he was a psychologist and started seeing a psychiatrist uh, for the very first time. And yeah, just my first foray, I'll say, into like medications or psychotropic medications for myself. Um, as it is for a lot of folks, you know, it was, uh, I'll, I guess I'll say scary or like, you know, mm. I was very much open to that intervention or treatment option. I wanted the help. I wanted to get these sim- symptoms under control, but yeah, I had no idea how I was going to react to any of it. Right. And so I ended mm. up going to the ER in, um, reaction to one of them, the very first one that I tried actually, um, because of the side effects, unfortunately that, uh, affected me. And then um, the psychiatrist who prescribed me that medication, she doubted me in my experience in that. Uh, She's like, are you sure that wasn't the flu? I was like, uh, I don't think I would have been bedridden or having a rash all over my face and body if it was just the flu, you know? So, I mean, she was, I think a resident at the time. So I don't know, not to try and justify or explain away that kind of comment, but that was my first experience with psychiatry. I request after that comment, I requested to switch to a second psychiatrist. He was pretty hands off in his approach. Like I had very little idea as to like how to advocate for myself with medication, yeah. what even to try, but he very much put it on me of like, so what do you want to try? I was like, I have no yeah. idea. <laughs> I don't know what these, <laughs> so you're the doctor. And so, yeah. Um, he tried some antidepressants with me. They didn't really work. Just not that great of a first experience um, with that. But my therapy with the psychologist was wonderful. Very much set me on that. Just the very beginning of like my mental health journey. Um, but yeah, a little bit back to like the journey of that too is just, you know, so I then eventually graduated, right? Like in the spring, like, uh, or rather June, I guess of 2013. And then um, moved back home to, uh, family. Cause I did not know actually at the time 
I thought I was pre-med. I still had one foot in when I fell out the door of pre-med. Wanted to hold on to that um, a bit longer as an option, but I was still in the midst of the episode, or at least rather I'll back up a bit. I fell into my first major depressive episode um, during that summer. So I was taking summer classes, but I couldn't bring myself to go to them. I ended up withdrawing from those courses um, in the end, but because I literally wasn't going at all. And so um, there's that, but then I was back in the swing of a hypomanic episode, like around the fall. And then unfortunately my dad got the brunt then of a lot of my irritability, my rage. And so we had quite a lot of conflict, unfortunately, when I moved back home. So that again, it like that prompted me further of like, okay, I really need to make sure I seek out, yeah. you know, help and really get my mental health treatment in line. And I'll just say, you know, that was such a frustrating, confusing, stressful experience for me. I had no idea how insurance worked, let alone in the mental health capacity uh, with services. Eventually I figured it out, but, and I got, you know, a great therapist. I got a really great third psychiatrist. She really understood my needs and really listened to me. Um, so yeah, you know, that, that was, I would consider that kind of like the second phase of like my mental health treatment and journey. But so uh, on the professional end, I was trying to figure it out. I ended up taking four gap years between undergrad and entering my doctorate program. So after graduating, I um, did an internship at a hospital while working as a swim coach on the side, just, you know, turned some cash. And I think I'm trying to think what made me then eventually pivot and reconsider mental health more seriously. And I think after having gone through therapy for a good amount of time, and then um, I think a professor even encouraged me to like a um, professor mentor, like towards the end of my time at college, who I still kept in touch with, she encouraged me like really think about maybe PhD or, you know, psychology, like really pursue psychology in the on the doctorate level. Um, so those got me thinking, and then I decided to find jobs in mental health, right? But so at the bachelor's level, that was kind of actually pretty difficult to try and find jobs for that, but eventually found, you know, a couple at outpatient treatment centers in LA, um, which is where I uh, ended up meeting my now husband. And so just that kind of wow. like kickstarted, you know, a bunch of like, I would say the next part of my journey of then, okay, so affirming mental health is the path that I want to go. Um, and then I applied to grad schools and eventually entered my PsyD program in New York City and um, obviously graduated with my mm -hmm. doctorate and then, yeah, so that brings me to now. Wow. Um, I appreciate how forward and transparent you are about your journey, uh, because uh, we don't always get to hear details or backstories or testimonies from individuals and why they went into their professions. And also one of the reasons I was excited to bring you on today is because there, there are a lot of mental health issues um, among folks in higher education, both in undergrad and especially at the graduate student level. And I know that I, I, in my experience, I don't have the data, but in my experience, I hear a lot of folks who uh, primarily focus on addressing issues related to depression and anxiety. But I know that there are so many other uh, you know, like mental health uh, concerns or uh, disorders or illness, like you name it, whatever it is, like there's, yeah. there's such an array. And I myself have a loved one who was recently diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I'm not sure which type it was. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still learning. Um, and it's it's so incredibly challenging. And so I, I, I wanted to bring someone who has ex that twofold experience. You know, you've got the lived experience, but also the, the, the research or the professional knowledge. You, you have your PsyD, you're, you're doing the work, you're practicing as well. Um, and I know that going, uh, you know, navigating higher education, whether it's the college years or graduate work is already hard. It's challenging as it is. But then you add something like bipolar disorder 
And it just compounds that even further. And, and I could hear some of that in, when you talked about the two stages for you and in, in getting support. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you can share maybe some other common challenges that you know that specifically students with bipolar disorder may face in higher ed or as they go through their educational journey in general. And um, and then additionally, whatever you know is comfortable for you, because I am I am a daughter of Mexican immigrants, and I know that for us and in our community and culture, mental health is highly stigmatized. So similar to you, um, I was highly sensitive, or I still am. <laughs> I still am highly Perfect. sensitive, but as a child, it it was something that I was shamed about. Yes. And so you mentioned about like your experience with your family. And so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more about you know, some other challenges that students specifically in the AAPI community may be dealing with if they themselves also have bipolar disorder. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so many layers to this too, right? Of, you know, I also identify as a first gen graduate student. No one else in my family pursued beyond a bachelor's degree in my family. So I was very much, you know, kind of trying to strike out on my own. I didn't quite know what this path exactly was going to look like or what, you know, um, I really had to figure it out a lot along the way. And so, you know, I wish I had a resource like you back then when I was going through my grad school experience. But back to your question, though, of, you know, some of those challenges and, you know, as we can imagine, stressors that are rampant in grad school, right, exams, presentations eventually are thesis or dissertation defense, right? We can imagine that there will be some flare-ups. Uh, for me, there were some mini episodes along the way. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would call them full-blown episodes because I was well-managed under medication mm -hmm. at the time throughout, fortunately. Um, so there's that, you know, we can imagine mm -hmm. that. And then for me, like irritability, it again comes in with that. I was extra snappy when stressed. Um, like I really went off on a roommate <laughs> during the first year like that level of rage, right? Like it really came through um, mm -hmm. at that time. And so there's some of those, like some interpersonal difficulties that could come up for uh, folks with bipolar disorder going through higher ed. Uh, a couple else I'll mention is you know, impulsivity being mm -hmm. another part of the hypomania or mania. So for me, I was spending a lot impulsively racking up debt when I'm already a poor <laughs> graduate yeah. student. Um, I ended up taking out more loans than I needed looking back on that now. So that's unfortunate, but, um, you know, thought I needed that extra cash to just go spend, spend, spend. And then also with transition and adjustment, uh, whether just starting out of grad school, throughout grad school, there comes a lot of opportunity for stimulation and activation, which can rev up the mania, at least for me, mm. I can speak to that for sure. So moving to a new area, meeting new people, getting used to a new system that we find doesn't work for us, yeah. changing practicum training sites each year. So as yeah, all those changes are transitions, right? So it really stresses the need for stability and routine for students with bipolar disorder, but that's incredibly difficult, right? Given how destabilizing grad school is much yeah. of the time, as I'm sure you and other uh, guest speakers talk about. And so, uh, but yeah, I could not stress enough, like how much stability and routine is paramount, at least again, for me, you know, for my mental health with bipolar yeah. disorder. And then switching a bit to the um, aspect or layer of being um, Asian American identified or, you know, other students who are in the AA and HPI community, we deal with the dual sort of experience of both invisibility and hypervisibility. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I mean by that is, you know, invisibility as the model minority, if folks don't know what that means, it's the model minority myth, we're pitted against other minorities be being viewed as quote unquote, better than, more successful than. Um, and because we're quote unquote so successful, we don't need help, which we know isn't true. Uh, and we're not a monolithic group. There's a lot of disparities in, um, across the diaspora, you know, of A and HPI communities. Um, 
but so that gets internalized though, you know, for people uh, in who are AA and HPI identified. And we see that in the underutilization of mental health care services by our community. There's a lot of other factors that go into that, but that's a big one. And when I talk about the hypervisibility part, we are seen as the perpetual foreigner or the token mm. minority, right? So I was the only Asian female in my cohort at my grad program um, at a PWI. Um, so I was called on once before by a white older man professor to explain why would an a <clears throat> excuse me Asian female patient avert her eyes at him in session as if I can speak for one that patient and two for all of Asian female identifying <laughs> people so that I didn't quite catch that at the, you know I, these mi micro or macro aggressions were still not so salient to me but one of my classmates actually called attention to that to me later after the fact and she was like and she's a, a white identified student but still she caught that and brought mm -hmm. you know raised that with me I was like oh yeah that is that <laughs> that is <laughs> microaggressive but um so you know we are seen as that and so with that comes assumptions stereotypes we should be smart quiet deferential or we're not speaking up enough or we're um according to white standards really and so I've gotten feedback in the past before for my program even though I felt like I was like to give myself credit I felt like I was fairly uh engaged in class like I was pretty participatory but then I would get feedback in my evaluations like oh I need to speak up more in class when it's like is that because is that really a fair assessment or are you just viewing me through the lens of how you think an Asian female should be held up to white standards in those ways um and so obviously like these stereotypes are really harmful views of us were especially salient during the pandemic with anti-Asian hate crimes yeah. rampant right and so Another challenge that I could speak to for myself during that period is that the silence was deafening from faculty and staff on that issue. On there which felt, issue? Oh, sorry, about showing support around um, for students who may be impacted by anti-Asian yeah. hate. Um, you know, I emailed one time after a shooting happened, unfortunately, over um, in Atlanta, requesting for check-ins. Yeah or just making space, some kind of added support for those of us who may be more impacted by that sort of event. And just the broader general, you know, context too of what's been going on. But out of the faculty and program director, I emailed three faculty. So I think it was maybe like 12 or so faculty. I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly, but out of those three responded to me, the rest, no response. Two of those were adjunct faculty. One was, oh. um, yeah. So one was, um, I forget exactly the status, but you know, he'd been part of faculty for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the program director who, um, I have like a, had additional relationships with two and other capacities. She responded back to me saying, oh yeah, we have a statement planned. We're going to put out a statement. We were just holding off and waiting, you know, because of the shoot, you know, to account for the shooting that happened. And I found that very hard <sighs> to <laughs> accept or to mm -hmm. believe, to be honest. I'm like, okay, but this has been, the anti-Asian yeah. hate crimes have been going on for some time now. This was like, I think maybe in this, um, yeah, just some months have passed already mm -hmm. and we were already seeing these things. And so I'm like, eh, it's taking you this amount of time and you're waiting, you said you're gonna put out the end of the week what's the hold up? Yeah. <laughs> or like, why is it taking my prompting, you know, in order to have a statement, even just a statement, let alone actual concrete support, which was not, I felt given at the time. So those are some challenges yeah. I could speak to. I feel like that's a whole other layer too. It's not just the challenges of like, the challenges of navigating higher ed with bipolar disorder, but then the challenges of navigating higher ed as a person of color, but then as 
AA MHPI member of that community. And then on top of that, uh, you're at a PWI. So there's, you know, specific things that come up when, when you're attending graduate school at a PWI, as opposed to, you know, another institution, whether it's, you know, um, uh, HBCU or um, right. HSI, you name them. Um, yet the, I feel like you brought on a whole, uh, it's like a, you opened up a whole can of worms. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, if There's, we had all I day. Can only <laughs> imagine your graduate school experience and just how challenging it must have been for you. Yeah. Uh, thank yeah. You. yeah. And I'm wondering um, what helped you to, like, how did you either navigate or overcome or like deal with these challenges? They're like multi layered challenges when you were going through your program. Right. So I was desperate for mentorship, whether that be from peers. Uh, you know, in cohorts above me, whether that be outside of my program, I, I, it didn't take me too long to um, figure out or find, like, I'm not getting that support within this program. Unfortunately, I, again, being the only Asian female, I did not identify, I could not see, as far as I could tell in passing, people who identified as Asian as well on faculty. So I was desperate for some uh, sort of contact with people who could possibly, uh, to some extent, understand what I was going through. So that's in the, you know, my, um, as a BIPOC first gen grad student, but I have, to this day, you know, I feel like I still have never really found a community or even really many people I could talk to who mm. have bipolar disorder, who have also navigated higher education um, in the way that I have. So there's that. Um, we got to find would, those folks for you. <laughs> seriously, yeah. if you're out there, please reach out to me. I would love to talk with you. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it took some time, but eventually I found Asian American Psychological Association. I think I got like a, I forget how I first got connected to them. Maybe it was like an email, some alerting to one of their events or something. But so during the pandemic, especially, I was feeling very isolated. I felt very alone. My family's all back in California. A lot of my friends and support. My fiance at the time was back in uh, California. So I felt very alone. Um, and so I really turned to a lot of online support mm -hmm. at, um, at the time. Like uh, they were offering mentorship office hours uh, by professionals in the organization. I was attending like community peer support groups. So one by Asian Mental Health Project that I found on social media. Um, they are doing amazing things now and I'm so proud and happy to see how much they're doing with their organization now. But so yeah, you know, attending, trying to find those spaces for myself, really trying to seek out where can I get the support. Um, continue to attend therapy as well, like really needed to continue attending to my mental health in those ways. I've been real fortunate to have found, you know, this therapist who I still talk to this, to this day. So that was what, you know, like over five years ago now that I first started working with this therapist. So oh. if that says anything, you yeah. know, about the relationship I have with this therapist, and that's the longest I can say that I've worked with one too. So that's, that's, I feel like uncommon for sure, but I've been real fortunate in that. And so, attended therapy, continued to attend therapy, had my medications well managed. Um, and then eventually, you know, found the select few people within my program uh, in cohorts above me. Like I can name, you know, a couple off the top of my head. Um, you know, they attended my wedding, like they're very close friends and now uh, to this day for me. And, you know, they, they are Asian identified. And it's not to say that those who aren't can't be supportive or be empathic towards these experiences I described, but truly those people just got it with me. Mm -hmm. And it was very, um, uh, like it just felt restorative to just be around them. So those were some ways. Yeah. It's so critical, so important to have community and to have support. And I'm glad that you called attention to kind of finding support, even if it's also virtually, mm -hmm. especially like you mentioned during the pandemic, because I, I, 
I myself have struggled with this with navigating chronic illness. And I also mm-hmm. know other individuals who are navigating different types of mental health disorders or different types of disabilities. And it can get pretty isolating. Um, and sometimes, like you said, like it's that's not to say that someone who doesn't have same identities, same experiences, um, same struggles. It, um, it doesn't mean that they might not get it, but it, it definitely helps to have support from folks who have some sort of um, shared experience. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that because I know it's hard and, and it takes a while. And I'm, I mean, I'm assuming like it's, it's a ongoing process because I'm still building my community. I feel like it, yes. and that, it never stops. Yeah, <laughs> really though. Yeah. And if there's anything that the pandemic taught us among a lot of things is that it did open the doors. I felt like to, you know, we can find these communities, we can find these spaces for ourselves. And I think a lot of those support, uh, yeah, the support that I can now identify, like a lot of it has been virtual or has been, you know, across the country or in different parts of the country. So I think that's really important. Yeah. That we are able to access those things for ourselves. Yeah. I I actually want to transition to a different topic that comes up a lot for folks who either are dealing with, you know, any type of with disability, chronic illness, mental health issue, neurodivergence, you name it. Um, that's the topic of disclosing and disclosure. And I know that there's no right or wrong answer for this and that it's a very, very personal thing, but I I would love to hear your thoughts on the subject, on this specifically disclosing a bipolar disorder diagnosis. And also what individuals should consider thinking about if they're thinking about disclosing to different individuals. It it might be, you know, loved ones, it might be family members, it might be peers, classmates, and even potentially professors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing up this topic because I have been asked about that before in other talks or spaces, and it's been a continuing or evolving sort of thing for me. So, you know, that's something I'm still developing for myself of how am I navigating that for myself? Like really is context dependent, person dependent. But so I'll just say, you know, on a personal and professional level, I think of disclosure as a gift that not everyone gets to have from Mm. you or, you know, anyone who has something to disclose because it, this is personal. It is sensitive. So I would say, and this is something that I try to ground myself in myself of like being intentional and selective about who it is that I disclose to. So what I mean by that is, you know, I'm a pretty intuitive and relational person as it is, again, as a person, as a professional, like I, that comes through in my line of work, in my approach to therapy as well. So what I say is going to follow that of considerations to make and, um, you know, for me, it's like I consider the rapport or kind of relationship I have with that person. Do they feel safe? Are they someone who will be receptive to this kind of personal information about me? Uh, would this ultimately help yeah. me more than it may hurt me? And I think those are such hard questions to ask ourselves because there's always that risk. It will feel risky and we can't ever fully know with confidence how someone may react even those closest to us right like how you know that that kind of response to disclosure will be so even if the reaction isn't what you want from that person I try to then take that as you know more about that person then and your relationship with them and where you might stand or how you might want to go forward in that relationship with that person so with family it's more complicated though it's not like especially in the AA and HPI, or really, you know, I feel like any BIPOC community, it's not so easy to say, just Mm -hmm. cut off family. Just don't, (laughs) just walk away from family if they don't accept you, receive you. And I wish I could speak better to that myself because I haven't really talked to my family immediate, extended, otherwise, you know, with them about my bipolar disorder, to be real honest, even after all these years. So that's something, (laughs) that's still a, an open Pandora's box that I haven't quite. Uh, I mean, I don't talk about it 
that openly with family members either so yeah and I'm pretty open about is struggling with waves of yeah. depression and anxiety and high mm. sensitivity um yes. but I, I it's not like it's something and I'm like oh mom lately I haven't been feeling so well mentally no no exactly yeah. yeah which is so tough right it's just like you know one would hope or at least I would love to be able to feel that with my family but that's where I'm at with them and so mm. um not only considering the rapport kind of relationship, but also consider what is the purpose or intent of your disclosure. So what outcome are you hoping or looking for from this disclosure? Is it to educate and raise awareness? Are you challenging a stigmatized statement or questioning someone's bias? Uh, Statements like the weather is so bipolar. That's a common one I I hear still so much to this day. People with bipolar disorder are crazy they're violent, they're unpredictable, things like that, Um, which I've considered like a higher level sort of consideration of like, you know, as for me, I still halt or hesitate to gently or, you know, out of kindness, you know, call out someone or to educate someone on those kind of things. Um, Even as more open as I've been with my diagnosis, it's still an ongoing struggle for me of like how I do that with people. So anyway, um, is it to inspire others? give them hope, help them feel less alone with um, your disclosure? Is it to draw in more support for yourself? Is it to repair a relationship that is important to you? Um, So I say that I pose those questions because, you know, there's a lot of shame and guilt that can come Mm. after episodes, whether hypomanic, manic, or depressive, but I would consider giving pause before disclosing if it were to alleviate those kind of feelings right away or to explain away behaviors that happen during those episodes or worst of all, feeling coerced into Mm -hmm. disclosure. Unfortunately, I heard about this just the other day about a student who very much felt that and that person did not, was actually pretty manipulative or did not, was not a safe person to disclose that ultimately to. So that was sad to hear, but Again, so you might want to consider the kind of relationship you have with a person. And the last thing I'll just say is it really should not feel mandatory or, again, like you're being pressured into disclosing. So with professors, um, that's a tricky one because, uh, you know, at least as far as my understanding goes, like either at most or if not all uh, universities, you have the disability center or department, you know. Yes like HR at workplaces, right, to facilitate Mm -hmm. accommodations without it being compulsory for any of us to disclose the nature of our conditions. So I just want to put that out there, too, that that is an option. We should never feel like we have to be forced Mm -hmm. into disclosing. Yeah. I think it's good to remind students about that, because I think that that there is a fear there in accessing and requesting accommodations because they might think that they have to then disclose to, quote unquote, justify the accommodations. Yeah. As I'm glad that you mentioned that, that you can still request accommodations, go through disability services, accessibility services, and not have to disclose to your professors. And actually, on that note, I'm wondering if... And I, I I know some of these questions are very like highly individualized, but yes. are you aware of any type of accommodations that might work for individuals with bipolar disorder who are students? I thought that's, you know, that's that, a tough one. It yeah. is because that's a, and, but it's a great question though. And I wish I could answer that better because to be honest, so when I was still at undergrad, when I entered my grad program, I have still wrestled with that kind of identity for myself of yeah. having a disability, um, to be real honest. And so like, you know, uh, from an outside perspective or from a third party perspective, I am fairly high functioning mm. with my diagnosis and it's taken a lot of work, right. For me to like, be able to get to this point with yeah. this di- condition, but I could not say or speak specifically to what those accommodations could look like. Cause I didn't seek those out for myself mm-hmm. uh, during grad school. I wish I could have, there were some mm-hmm. moments that it could have been helpful. <laughs> I don't know what that could have looked like, but. Or yeah. alternately, like what could faculty, staff administrators do to, just to better support students struggling with mental health conditions in general? I know um, when it comes to accommodations, it's very, I, I say it's highly individualized and, you know, not everybody will 
end up needing to request accommodations to navigate their higher ed journey. But um, I do think that a lot more can be said about what the systems and folks who work for the systems can do to support students. Yeah, so a few things I'll say about that, and I'm also drawing from what I observed during my internship year training um, at a university counseling center as well. So being in a university system, but on the mental health side, like that was a very, uh, you know, very much learning experience too, and like navigating that kind of system in that capacity. But so a few things I'll say is show that students can come to you for support, not just saying it, not just having a statement on the syllabus of, about accommodations, actually speak to it explicitly. Some people, I feel like kind of just plop that on there and then just kind of take it for granted, like, oh, it doesn't need to be talked about, but I think it could be important if it is talked about explicitly, even if briefly, you know, just going over it, you know, not just as a rush thing to check off the box of, you know, going over what accommodations could look like in your classroom or, yeah, the process of getting those. So walk the talk, follow through with your actions, and extend support within the scope of their roles. So I couldn't speak too specifically what that could look like for them, mm -hmm. but consider the scope, right? Um, I feel like this goes without saying, but it is surprising to me still how often I hear of how inappropriate or insensitive some people are and uh, mm -hmm. with, you know, in response to students with mental health conditions. So be compassionate, be curious. You never know what someone might be going through or what it took for them to get to that point. Um, you know, do not pressure anyone ever mm -hmm. to have to disclose about their conditions. Um, but if they choose to disclose to you, you know, ask what may be helpful mm -hmm. or not helpful as support. Don't assume or impose your own opinions thinking you might know better than the student themselves. Um, if they don't know or can't articulate it, then offering resources to them so that they can get better informed and access the support they need. So giving them that agency, right? Um, and then the last thing I'll just say is, you know, being mindful of the language used in messaging sent around mental health explicitly or implicitly. Yeah. And again, I really appreciate your word choice actually of mental health conditions, because that's how I describe it for myself. You know, that's a whole nother thing that yeah. I won't get into, but, you know, words have impact. They do matter. And so we I'm all. So, yeah. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to. No, quickly, please. Yeah. I, I, I'm not perfect. And sometimes I know that I myself mess up, even though I try to be yeah. more aware. And so using mental health condition, because sometimes I will switch in between that and saying struggle, like mental health struggle. Mm -hmm. But then I think about like with everything, there's always the other side of the coin. So like, yes. uh, I feel like with that condition comes a certain assets or like the positives there's 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 two sides to everything so for me with like neurodivergence and with chronic illness it's like learning to embrace some parts of it too but I, yeah. I, I just I'm sorry I cut you off there it was no, just, no, no. Thinking, just to acknowledge that like one I'm not perfect and two I'm yes. very aware that words matter and that when we do know better to to try to be better and try to you know know better mm -hmm. do better um, but it, it can be tricky. And um, yeah, so even if like if you could say some things that maybe folks can start to rephrase or anything that, you know, you mentioned some things that come to mind that sometimes people say that can be harmful to folks who have any kind of mental health conditions. Yeah, like um, not saying things like, oh, <clears throat> whether to a student's face directly, or if it's somehow gets back to a student of attributing their whatever challenges that's coming up for them as laziness, oh. as inco incompetence. That's <laughs> a big trigger it. of mine. Oh, I don't, oh I don't believe gosh. in laziness. Just no. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know that, oh, we can go all day. Yeah. For I, I'm not like, I, and so many levels for me, like chronic illness, needing to pace myself to survive neurodivergent folks. Like sometimes they're just like, things are so hard for them to navigate that. Or for us, I should say that like some things get, you know, perceived of as laziness when it's just, yes. I need extra support. Yes. Yeah. And then again, if you add that extra layer being BIPOC, being first gen, oh all those things the compounded. stereotypes of folks yes. who are BIPOC first gen or immigrants children of immigrants of like you have to be hard hard working 
Um, that's not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing, but we also are allowed to rest. We deserve to rest. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I just went off on a tangent there. No, <laughs> really, and I mean, struck, that's important. it struck something yeah. in real. <laughs> no, it's such an important point though, right? Yeah, it yeah. resonates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, I want, I, I know we're getting close to wrapping up, but I want to, uh, you know, explicitly ask you for any um, insights or words of advice or resources for individuals out there who might be new to arriving at a diagnosis and are not quite at a space where, you know, they might be high functioning, like they might still need that extra support and trying to figure out like, how do I manage? How do I navigate this? How do I arrive at a place where I'm not on survival mode, but I can begin to thrive? You know, what words of advice, what resources or anything that they can tap into or learn more about or and just anything that comes up, up at the top of your head, because yeah. I, I, I this is what I wish I could tell folks that I, yes. I don't have that expertise. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking about that. And I'm happy to share. Yeah, because I wish I had this knowledge that I have now. I mean, you know, lived experience or, you know, yeah. learn as we go, but um, so I want to be mindful of your audience too. I think you said that some of your listeners are international or global across the, um, uh, over 90% of my audience is actually in the U S and then, oh, okay. yeah, so primarily in the U S actually I have a really strong, uh, population or amount of folks that listen to me. I think one fourth of my listeners are all based in California Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> it's because I'm originally from California. So probably from that. And then, and then next after that, I do have, um, it's Canada, Canada, mm. India, like in terms of um, what other countries are, are are higher on my listenership. Yeah. Got it. So as far yeah. as resources go, just to frame it as, you know, I'm speaking US from like space. US space. Yes. yes. Yeah. So organization, so th- these really aren't plugs, like it's just because I, I'm familiar <laughs> with, uh, from my involvement with these organizations, but Depression Bipolar Support Alliance and uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, have peer-led support groups and other programming to help support folks, um, whether with depression, bipolar, or other mental health conditions. Um, International Bipolar Foundation is another resource similar to them. Uh, You mentioned BP Hope Magazine, so bphope.com and its publication, BP Magazine wealth of information, a lot of articles, personal stories, educational info, research backed uh, for folks to pour over. I wish I, I I have not even, I feel like I've scratched the surface of like the amount of information they have on that side in their publication. So I would direct folks to that. Um, And then in general, for words of advice, you know, three that I have in mind is identify and build your support network. I feel like that's crucial to have whether that be peers, faculty, administration, family, if that feels appropriate, or you know, you're at that point with family, partners, friends, and as we mentioned, online groups, right? Like whatever yeah. that network could look like for yourself. Um, creating that safety net for yourself with coping skills. That, you know, self-care is very much a buzzword nowadays, but that is part of it, you know, having your toolkit of different ways in which to take care of yourself know your resources, have a wellness plan and emergency plan. So meaning, you know, knowing how to identify folks who can help you in times of crisis or what will promote your wellness. Uh, And then finally taking heart that this is temporary. All this is temporary. It will become a phase in your life that you can look back on. Uh, The journey is different for everyone, but really giving ourselves credit for already making it to this point, taking stock of how far we've come, what it took to get here. Um, Because this is no small feat, you know, what we're doing and what we have done to get here. So I would just like to leave listeners with that. Thank you so much. I was taking notes. (laughs) I'm going to be adding all of those things in the show notes. So that way, folks, uh, and I also provide transcripts so folks can access that information if they need to. So absolutely. 
Um, anything else that maybe um, you wanted to share before um, we close up? Because if not, I would love for folks who resonated with what you shared to know how they can find you, reach you, follow your work. Yeah, so I'll share that in a bit. And just my final thoughts that I'll close with is, you know, first, thank you so much for having me. Uh, today, I'm glad we can make this happen <laughs> just within the week of speaking with each other. It truly was a pleasure to get to talk with you about these really important things. I'm grateful for the work you do. Um, and for listeners out there, um, again, with mental health conditions of any sort and, you know, who your audience that you, you know, do this for, know that you don't have to suffer in silence or be alone in your struggles especially when navigating systems that are not benefiting or very much work against us. So the more informed and aware you become of your mental health, the more you empower yourself and give yourself options. So just know these conditions do not have to define or limit you. Yes. Yeah, that's so right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauren. I uh, so appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, to share more about your knowledge and experience on the topic. So I really, really appreciate you being here with us today. Of course, yeah. And if others would like to continue following me, you're welcome to uh, go to Instagram. My handle is at dr.laurenyang, Yang. And I invite any connections on LinkedIn as well. You can find me as Lauren Yang, comma, Psy D. I will add those to the show notes as well. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining me in the Grad School Fem Touring Podcast. If you liked what you heard, here are three ways you can support the show. The first is to make sure you're subscribed and leave a review of the podcast. If you leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, you become eligible for a free half hour coaching session with me. Yes, that's right. One free session. Once you leave a review, you can email me a screenshot and I'll send you a link to sign up. The second way to show your love is to get yourself a copy of my free 15-page grad school fem touring kit, which includes resources on research, organization, grad school, and career prep. Go to gradschoolfemtouring.com slash kit to get it today. The third and last way to support my show is to follow me on social media. I am on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and occasionally TikTok with the handle at Grad School Fan Touring. Thanks again and until next time.